Welcome everyone to this video on the Unseen Poetry section to Unit 3. It's Section B of the English Literature A-Level. This video will focus on how to write an effective introduction for the Unseen Poetry element. What I'd like us to go over today then is how to write an effective introduction to an Unseen Poetry comparison. Because I think the introduction to an Unseen Poetry comparison is different to the Section A essays that you write at the start of the exam paper. What I'm looking for is for you to be able to see the strengths and weaknesses of example introductions. I think that's probably the most effective way of showing you what to do and what not to do. Hopefully you'll understand at the end of this video how to write an effective introduction, but also I'd like you to be able to write sophisticated introductions yourself. So it's not just knowing what makes a good one or make, what makes a bad one, it's also you having the ability to do this with any poem that turns up in the exam. For me, there are three main things that make an effective introduction for this type of essay. And the first one is I need to see a student who shows engagement with both poems from the very start. This is not the type of essay where you deal with one poem first and then you wait until halfway through the essay to introduce the second poem. From your very start of your introduction, I believe you need to show engagement with both of those poems. A good introduction, I think, will signpost your major ideas. Once you've done your planning element and you know what you want to say in your essay, I think it's a very good idea for your introduction to state where your essay is going to go. And then finally, your good introduction should engage with the specific theme given to you. So making sure that you're on target and you're talking about the things that need to be mentioned. We also need to make sure that we don't fall into the pitfalls that people generally stumble into. And what makes a less effective introduction, in my opinion, is an introduction that begins by dealing with both poems, considering them in isolation. There needs to be an element of comparison from the very start of your essay, not just telling me what poem A does and then what poem B does, dealing with the two of them together if you can. A poor introduction often parrots the essay title. So a lot of people think that the way to write a good introduction is to make sure you just say what the question says. So if the question says, how do these two poets present old people? A lot of people will start their introduction by saying, poem A and poem B presents different ways of looking at old people. It seems to say exactly what the question itself was stating. Now you do need to use key words from the title, but it shouldn't just be a regurgitation of what the question asked you. Finally, a poor introduction shows no understanding until the main body of the essay. What I like to see in an introduction is clear evidence that the student already knows what they want to say before they begin exploring those ideas. I don't like an essay where I can't pinpoint actual understanding in the introduction. So for the purposes of this video, this is the exam paper that we're using as practice. It's the June 2017 Unit 3 A2 paper. There were four poems given, and remember the rules for this essay is that you must use poem A. Poem A has to be in your essay, and then you get to decide which one of the other three poems you'd like to compare it to. So you can choose poem B, poem C, or poem D. Please remember, it's only one of poem B, C, or D. There is absolutely no reason for you to try and comment on all four of those poems. This comparison is between poem A and one of the remaining three. So poem A in this case is The Skylark by John Clare. I'm not going to read this to you. I've already read it to you. We've already thought about our ideas based on this poem. If you need to pause the screen and read it, or if you've got access to the uh, exam paper, you could just read it there. Poem B was Returning, We Hear the Larks by Isaac Rosenberg. Poem C was Red Kites at Tregaron by Gwyneth Lewis. And poem D was Parrot by Stevie Smith. The mark scheme for this essay is on your screen now. And it's very important that we look at the mark scheme because we need to remember there are certain goals when we write this essay. We do need to make sure 
sure we hit our AO1 and AO2, which you should be pretty um, used to by now. So we do need to make sure that our ideas are creative, that you know, you're engaging with this poem on a much deeper level than simply surface. And you need to make sure that you're using the right terminology and talking about those literary elements that, that make um, poetry. AO2, we need to make sure that we are analysing the connotation of language, so considering why a particular word is used and its effect, and also probing those ideas, probing the language that's used, probing those techniques and really explaining how they achieve desired effect. The most important part though, and this is why it's weighted double of the other assessment objectives, is AO4. You need to explore connections across literary texts. And this is the main reason why I'm making this video for you. It's because in your introduction, I do believe there are ways of you signposting your connections from the very start. So the question that we answer is this one. Compare the presentation of birds in poem A, The Skylark by John Clare, and in one other poem, either poem B, Returning, We Hear the Larks by Isaac Rosenberg, or poem C, Red Kites at Tregaron by Gwyneth Lewis, or poem D, Parrot by Stevie Smith. For the purposes of this video, we're going to use The Skylark, and we're going to compare it with Parrot by Stevie Smith. Before we write anything, there was a process I thought you should go through. And this is the process that I strongly recommend. The first thing, once you've read the question, is to read poem A. I know it sounds incredibly simple, but you do need to make sure that you read poem A in a nice and calm manner. The most scary thing about the unseen poetry is you've never read this poem before. Just control those nerves, read the poem, and remember, it's completely fine on your first reading to not understand everything. Nobody reads a poem and understands everything in the first try. So read it, and then read it again. And like I've mentioned before, just go through one line at a time, telling yourself what's happening. What's the image being created? And kind of just picture what you're being shown. So line by line, what's happening in this line? What's different to what I've just read? How is that thing being presented? And just form that image in your mind of what's actually happening or what's being shown in that poem. Once you've kind of got an idea of what the poem is saying, then it's time to start annotating. So then this is the third read through, you read through it, you start noticing some of the language used and you start considering the effects of those language choices. Noting things like, does the language change at any point in the text? How is, the, how is something being presented? Is that different to another image that is in this poem? And once you've done that, read it again and continue to make notes. When it comes to planning for your essay, spending lots of time is highly recommended. Please don't think your planning process is going to take you 10 minutes. Your planning process should take you a long time. When you've done with your planning process, you should feel confident that you know what you want to write. I wouldn't like to see a student beginning to write before they had an idea of what they'd like to say. Once you've spent that time, four readings, then you start reading poems B, C and D. And once you've read those poems, then you decide which one you think has got the richer connections. Not necessarily which one is your favourite or which one you like most. It's just the one that you think, as you read through, you could see very clear similarities or differences, or you, you can see what you might like to say about that poem, and simply make a decision. Whichever one you feel has the best potential. And once you've done that, go through the same process. Read the poem very, very carefully, line by line, making sure you understand what this poem is revealing, and then annotate. Go through language analysis, different techniques, and as you do that, then you read it again, and then you start listing those areas of similarity and differences, and then you start noticing, you know, where are those areas going to be that form my essay? And once you've done that, then you can start planning for your essay. Your plan could look any way you want it to. For me, this is how I've created mine. In the middle of my page, I've written birds in poem A and poem D. And that's simply to remind myself at any moment that this is what I'm doing. My central focus is on how birds are presented. And also I've stated very clearly which one of my poems um, I've chosen to link with poem A. 
From there, I try to note which areas are most fruitful for connections. So for me, freedom and confinement is probably one of the major areas that I need to talk about in uh, these poems, because clearly one of the birds has absolute freedom, the other bird has no freedom at all. Another area of similarity or difference was the natural and urban imagery being used. One of these poems is set in a paradise and the other is set in a dingy cage. And then finally, the light and dark imagery or the transcendence and the pain, where one of these birds gets to escape the misery and suffering of life, whereas the other one must wait and the only, the only um, abatement of his suffering is through death. On your screen, I've put lots of the ideas. I've put in red the quotations that I would talk about when it comes to uh, poem A, and then in purple, poem D. So a couple of ideas, for example, is one of these poems inspires listeners to be free. And the quotation I'd use there was, so think they while they listen to its song. Whereas the other poem contrasts that with waiting for death to come. So the parrot can only see freedom at the end of suffering, whereas the skylark is able to achieve um, freedom from the very beginning. Okay, the top left hand of your screen, happy wings. That adjective shows the ecstasy of being free and winnows in the air. That shows that this creature is happy and it's free and it's content. On the other hand, we've got the contrasting imagery of dingy cage. So whilst one can transcend, the other must sit and suffer in its, in its cage. So lots of different points. You can pause the video and have a look at those points. Just try to pick out areas that I think will go really well and link quite nicely. And I'll try to put those within those three areas. So now that you've read the poems, you've read the question, you've done your planning, you feel like you know what you want to say, I'm going to show you the first introduction that we're going to have a look at today. This introduction has some strengths, it has some weaknesses, but as we read through, I'll just pick out where I think this introduction goes wrong and what it could do to improve it. In this essay, I will compare how John Clare presents the bird in The Skylark with how Stevie Smith presents the bird in Parrot. I will explore how they present these birds using literary techniques and reveal how their depictions are similar and different. Now this is your stereotypical introduction, the type of introduction that says everything it's supposed to say while sim simultaneously actually saying nothing at all. The start of this introduction I think is particularly poor in this essay. Essentially, what you're doing to the examiner there is telling the examiner, I am writing an essay. And I don't think if you're writing a letter, you're going to start it with, I am writing this letter to you. Because that's incredibly simple and incredibly basic. You don't need to tell someone what you are doing. Instead, do it. If you're at a wedding and you have to make a speech, you don't stand up in front of everyone and say, I am doing a speech. Because it's implied. Of course you're doing a speech, you're in a wedding, you're standing up and everyone's listening to you. In this case, you're writing an essay. Of course you are, you've been asked to write an essay. So I don't like it when essays begin with, in this essay I will. I think it's far too basic. The second thing I notice about this introduction, and I've mentioned this before, is the first person personal pronoun I. Now, it's up to debate whether or not that's a, um, a strength or a weakness in essay writing. However, the way I think about it is at university level, you very rarely use the personal pronoun I in an essay. So instead of saying I, write it in the third person. Instead of saying I will compare how John Clare presents the bird, you could just state John Clare presents the bird in the Skylark as. I'd always try and remove yourself, particularly from the introduction, Try and remove yourself from it because it's simply a much more academic way of presenting an argument. Now, that's not to say that doesn't have a purpose in this essay. If you would like to state your opinion, if you'd like to state your position on analysing a particular piece of language, you absolutely can. And that's well within your rights. You can do that. There's simply much more sophisticated ways of presenting that argument. OK, so for me, I would prefer to see the word I 
disappearing, particularly from the introduction. The next thing I would like to mention is this. So in this essay, I will compare how John Clare presents the bird. That's stating exactly what this essay is going to do. But it's also just parroting what you're supposed to do. So this essay essentially asks you to compare John Clare's poem with Stevie Smith's poem. This student spends their first line saying exactly that. In this essay, I will compare how John Clare presents the bird in Skylark with how Stevie Smith presents the bird in Parrot. That's exactly what the question has essentially asked you to do. So all you've done is just stated that I'm doing what I'm told. If I look at that first line, I cannot see any understanding of those poems at all. I could write this introduction without actually having read either of those poems. I haven't shown that I understand Clare's poem at all, and I haven't shown that I've understood Stevie Smith's poem at all. All I've shown I've understood is the question, and I don't think the purpose of the essay is just to explain that you understand the question. You have to understand the question, but it's far more important to understand what you're going to do in this essay. Okay. The next part is this final line, because this introduction is only two lines. I'm not upset at how short it is. The best introductions of, are concise. However, with the final line where it says, I will explore how they present these birds using literary techniques and reveal how their depictions are similar and different. Again, I don't have to have read those poems to write that line. That sentence, if I just remove the word birds and change it to something different, that's a statement that could be put in any essay, but it doesn't really mean anything. Whilst, yes, I agree, the purpose of this essay is to consider the literary techniques and consider how these depictions are similar and different, instead of just telling me that there are similarities and differences, why not start revealing some of those similarities and differences from the beginning? There's no signposting of an argument. By reading this essay introduction, I don't know what points you're going to make. I don't know where this essay is going to go. I don't have any understanding of these poems at all as a reader. So what I'd like you to do in your introduction is to drip a little bit of your overarching understanding of these poems so that from the start of the essay, I can see that you understand the poetry and you understand what your essay is going to look like. For me, introduction is quite a poor one. It's quite a weak piece of writing. It's the type of writing that you see at the start of Key Stage 4 um, because people assume that's what you're supposed to do at the start of an essay. But I'd like to see a little bit more understanding from the very start. So if we have a look at introduction two, you'll see there are some slight similarities and some slight differences when it comes to that first introduction. This one seems to do what introduction one does, but has started listening to some of the advice that I've just given. So this is the introduction. The Skylark by John Clare and Parrot by Stevie Smith both present birds in different ways. The Skylark is about a bird that is disturbed and flies into the sky. Parrot is about a bird that is confined to a cage. In this essay, I will compare and contrast how these birds are presented. I would argue that introduction two is a little bit better than introduction one. And the main reason is because there is actually some understanding or some engagement with the poems from the start, whereas the first poem had very little engagement at all. The first line is similarly weak. The Skylark by John Clare and Parrot by Stevie Smith both present birds in different ways. That's simply stating that these are the two poems that are going to form the essay. So again, that first line isn't particularly strong. But the second line where it says the Skylark is about a bird, it's a little bit better, isn't it? It's about a bird that is disturbed and flies into the sky. From this introduction, I can see that this student has actually read the poem. It doesn't necessarily show that they understand the depth of that imagery, but at least they've read the poem and they've engaged with it at a superficial um, surface level. So whilst the understanding at the start of this essay is very simple, at least there is a little bit of it. The, he, the, this student does exactly the same thing. So then it says, Parrot is about a bird that is confined to a cage. Again, at least I can see that they have read this poem but haven't really engaged those deeper uh, levels of understanding. At the end of this essay, they do the same thing. In this essay, I will compare and contrast how these birds are presented. 
So they're stating that there are similarities or differences when it comes to these two birds and their depiction, but wouldn't it be more helpful to show a little bit of that understanding at the start? So whilst there's understanding and engagement with the superficial qualities of those two poems, there's actually no revealing of understanding of the connections. So in terms of AO1 and AO2, okay, AO1 very poorly is being ticked, there's no way I can give any marks or any indication that they're going to do well in AO4. What I would like is your examiner to see from your introduction that you are a student who is able to tease out information and um, similarities and differences with these poems. This student doesn't quite successfully engage with AO3, AO4 in the way I'd like them to, but it is a little bit better than introduction one. Introduction three builds on what introduction two started doing, but does it to a slightly better um, level. Through employing imagery of freedom and nature, Claire uses the skylark as a symbol of escape. Stevie Smith's contrasting imagery of disease and confinement revealed the damaging effect of incarceration on the, on the parrot. What this introduction begins to do is it begins to engage with how that poem is actually created. So this student is able to identify that one of the central pieces of imagery in Claire's poem is that of freedom and nature. This student is not just on a superficial level telling me what happens in the poem, it's actually revealing how that skylark is being used and what the poet is actually doing. So the word imagery there is really showing that this person understands what they're going to say about this poem before they've started the main body. Where it says the skylark is a symbol of escape, this student is able to identify that this skylark is not simply a bird, but this bird represents something on a deeper level. So this student is able to engage with the actual understanding of this poem instead of just saying that what just saying what happens in that poem. So whilst sometimes you won't get a nice and neat compact statement like that for a poem, sometimes poems don't have that simple um, statement that you can make, this student is able to identify what they believe is the central theme to that poem. And I think that's stronger than the previous, poem, uh, the, the previous introduction. The previous introduction, this is what happens in the poem. Introduction three, this is what the poem is doing. Slight difference there, and I think this one is slightly stronger. The next part is Stevie Smith's contrasting imagery of disease and confinement. This is where this student has made big gains on the student who did introduction two. By using the word contrasting imagery there and stating that, that contrasting imagery is one of disease and confinement in comparison to the escape freedom and nature of the previous poem, they've already stated that this essay is going to cover those areas. And that's called signposting showing the examiner that in this essay I am going to talk about the imagery of disease and confinement and I'm going to explain how that is dim different to the imagery of freedom and nature in the first poem. This student is able to show that AO3, oh sorry, AO4 is going to be an enormous part of the essay, as it should be, because that's where the marks are. The final thing they say is that it reveals the damaging effect of incarceration on the parrot. So this introduction is starting to state what is going to be covered in the essay. Now, this student has not analysed any of those details. You know, please don't think I'm asking you to um, put analysis in your introduction. I'm really not. What I'm simply asking you to do is to show from the beginning where your central ideas are and guide the examiner towards those. Introduction four is very similar to introduction three in what it says, but is able to show a little bit more skill than the previous one. Claire's imagery of freedom and nature as the bird winnows in the wind with happy wings presents the skylark as a symbol of escape. In sharp contrast, Stevie Smith's use of imagery of sick and green disease and confinement within a dingy cage reveals the damaging effect of incarceration on the parrot.
This student is able to identify how this poem works and what one of the central arguments to their essay is going to be. We know that the first paragraph is probably going to be analysing the imagery of freedom and nature. So this student is able to show clear understanding of the poem and its deeper meaning from the very start. But in terms of the way it's written, this student is able to drop some direct quotations from the text into uh, the body of their essay. So if you're going to talk about how the um, bird seems to be free and the bird seems to be happy, why not drip feed some of those quotations as we're writing? Try and create those quotations part of our sentences with those embedded quotations. So whilst I would always say don't analyse language in your introduction, don't analyse those quotations, there's absolutely no reason why you can't litter your introduction with quotations from the text. The difference between this introduction and the previous one is that in this introduction I can see a student who is very confident in dealing with these two poems because they're able to put quotations in naturally as they're forming their central argument. The next part where it says the skylark has a symbol of escape in sharp contrast, again this student is doing what the previous one did. It's stating that there is a central difference between these two birds. And what they've then said is Stevie Smith's use of imagery of sick and green disease and confinement within a dingy cage reveals the damaging effect of incarceration on the parrot. So if this student is going to talk about how the imagery of disease and confinement is central, then why not drip feed sick and green to modify that word disease and then also the dingy cage to um, evidence the idea of confinement. So this student is able to take those ideas of the introduction for but is able to improve them slightly by showing a mastery of those texts by introducing those quotations early on. I think you need to be careful with this. I don't want you to go overboard and try and reword a whole introduction with constant quotations. But one or two carefully chosen quotations that are not analysed here will signpost that those ideas are going to be analysed probably in that next paragraph. So a little bit more advanced than what we saw in introduction three, even though the wording of this introduction isn't perfect. Introduction five is the final introduction I'm going to share with you. Please don't be intimidated because it is slightly longer than the previous ones. I still think it's concise in the way that it signposts the argument. So this introduction, I'll read it in its entirety first and then we'll pick out why I think this is slightly better. Through the juxtaposing imagery of the Skylark, who is given the gift of escape through her happy wings and the pain and toil suffered by the boys who work in the field, Claire presents the Skylark as a symbol of freedom and hope. At first to be envied, but then to be appreciated, as she endows her listeners with their own escape, as they smile and fancy. In contrast, the parrot is denied its freedom, incarcerated in its dingy cage and robbed of its birthright, flight. Through the contrasting imagery of nature and urbanised environment, the synthetic light of cities and the euphoric lightness of pa pastoral paradise, and the contrasting freedom and incarceration, Clay's bird is to be idolised, whilst Smith's bird is to be pitied. This student is able to show a much greater level of skill. And please, I need, I need you to understand, this is a difficult skill. This is something that needs to be practised quite a few times until you're able to master this level of clarity. The reason why I think this introduction is so much better is because by reading this introduction, I can see that this student really understands these two poems, but not just that, they're able to hint at what their essay is going to look like. This student knows exactly what they wanted to say before they've said it. Whereas the first couple of introductions, they don't have the ability to show that level of thought from the start of the essay. Those first two introductions will start off with a very simple statement and then they'll do some analysis and by the end of the essay they'll know what they wanted to say but this student is able to know what they want to say before they even begin and that's where really strong planning, really strong reading, really strong analysis before you start writing comes in. So the first thing that I notice in this introduction where it says through the juxtaposing imagery of the Skylark, this student realises that the imagery of 
the, the bird itself is not the only imagery. The other imagery that they'd like to mention at the start of this essay is the imagery of those boys. Because this student is arguing that that juxtaposing imagery is central to that poem. That poem wouldn't work unless it had both of those images. The word juxtapose in there is already starting to show that there are different ways of looking at things. So through the juxtaposing imagery of the skylark, who is given the gift of escape through her happy wings, can you see how this student is also embedding those quotations quite expertly in their introduction? And that continues all the way through. And the pain and toil suffering by the boys who work in the field, Claire presents the skylark as a symbol of freedom and hope. Again, this student is able to show that this bird is not simply a bird, it means so much more. It's the symbol of freedom and hope. But this student is able to show that that freedom and hope is only created by the juxtaposing imagery of those boys who have to walk along the battered road. And this student is able to go one step further again. This time, this student is able to say, at first to be envied, but then to be appreciated as she endowed her listener with their own escape as they smile and fancy. So not just that this bird is a symbol of freedom and hope, but this bird is able to allow other people freedom and hope through listening to its voice. I think that's the next level of understanding here. Some students will say this bird is just to be admired. However, this bird actually gives that gift. The gift is the thing that those boys wanted all along. So that extra level of detail. This student then says the immortal words in contrast, showing the examiner, look, I'm not just looking at this poem in isolation. I realise that the imagery from poem A is actually very different to the imagery of poem D. And by showing that at the start of the essay, it shows that they understand the purpose of this essay. This essay is not about analysing two poems. This essay is about analysing two poems together. In contrast, the parrot is denied its freedom. Again, that's a very clear understanding of this poem. And that juxtaposes the imagery that we've just mentioned. So whilst poem A is all about freedom and hope, poem D, straight away, is the opposite to that, because that bird is denied its freedom. Incarcerated in its dingy cage and robbed of its birthright flight. What this, poet, uh, what this writer then does is shows more understanding once more. And it spends the last half of this introduction signposting the major areas of similarity and difference. In those first few lines, it's essentially said that this happens in poem A, and this is why it's so important. Poem D shows us this. The last line, though, signposts the major parts of this essay. Through the contrasting imagery of nature and urbanised environment, well, that's one of the central connections in these two poems, the imagery of nature and the imagery of urbanisation. So it would probably make sense, as we've read this, to assume that one of the paragraphs is going to be focused on the difference between nature and urbanised environments. This writer is able to show the examiner, I'm going to talk about this, Expect it, it's going to turn up in my essay. I've already thought about it, and this is going to be one of my central arguments. But they haven't just said what they're going to contrast in one area. They then move on to tell us what their next paragraph is going to be. The synthetic light of cities and the euphoric lightness of pastoral paradise. So the student is telling the examiner that I'm also going to talk about another area of similarity and difference, which is the synthetic light and the euphoric lightness. So that area is another area that I'm going to talk about. The student who wrote introduction four mentioned one area of similarity and difference, whereas in introduction five, they're starting to show that there are multiple areas that they're going to discuss and that their essay is going to be nice and neatly structured all the way to the conclusion. It's going to be structured for clarity. I'm going to group these ideas together and then I'm going to group these ideas together and then finally I'll group these together. And the final idea that they've suggested is this, the contrasting freedom in incarceration. So I'd assume that would be another paragraph in their piece of writing. The last line, 
Clay's bird is to be idolised whilst Smith's bird is to be pitied, I think that shows very clearly that this writer really understands those poems. Because in those poems, one of them is idolised and the other one is pitied. And that shows that engagement with how the reader is supposed to respond to these poems. Because that statement at the end can only be made if this person understands both poems quite well. So introduction five is the type of introduction I think shows much more sophistication compared to the other ones. But you can see how all five of those introductions built in terms of strength. And introduction five is the type of essay introduction that I think um, is rewarded very highly with marks. I am not suggesting introduction five is the best piece of writing you've ever read in your life. I'm sure it's a little bit wordy in places, but it does show a higher level of skill compared to the, you know, the fairly poor introduction of introduction one.